Okay, so now you know how to take a family history, how to construct a pedigree from that history, and how to interpret that history and that pedigree to uncover risks for familial diseases. And that is a lot of important information to know. But the genetic basis for disease can also be caused by changes to the DNA. These changes are called mutations. So our learning objectives, we're going to review common types of mutations and understand their impact on protein synthesis and protein function. We'll discuss how mutations occur and the mechanisms of DNA repair. We'll identify common mutagens that can cause alterations in human health. Discuss how these mutations don't necessarily lead to health problems and apply the earlier content to understand how syndromes develop from bigger chunks of DNA uh, change. So partial deletions, inversions, duplications of chromosomes. Some of them are disorders of ploidy and some of them only affect certain gene loci, um, but we'll talk about them. All right, so mutation is a change to genetic material. I want you to understand the difference between somatic and germline. Um, somatic mutations are not inheritable. They happen in your non-sex cells, your um, skin cells, your bone cells, your lung cells. They're limited to individual cells. So they're changes to the DNA in a cell that are not inherited by offspring, although they can cause disease in the individual that, where they occur. So for example, there's DNA in the nucleus of your skin cells when you repeatedly expose your skin cells to ultraviolet light in the tanning booth or out in the sun, there can be damage to your DNA. If the body can't repair it efficiently over time, those mutations eventually can become the basis for malignant melanoma. The whole genetics of cancer is much more complicated than that, but the idea is a mutagen causes a change in a somatic cell. Germline mutations start in the sex cells, and then they're found in the cells of the offspring. So the parent's genome is originally normal, and a change occurs during meiosis for an egg cell or a sperm cell. When that gamete combines with another gamete to form an offspring, a zygote, that change will be present in every cell in that offspring's body. So for example, if we have a man of adver advanced paternal age, sometimes they have like deletions or um, inversions of genetic material as they get older and their DNA is more susceptible to damage and it's continually reproducing. And they have sperm that is missing information from a base pair on the 15th chromosome. So if that sperm combines with an egg, the offspring can inherit the genotype from that affected sperm cell. And a lot of, there are like 15,000 things that can go wrong um, that you can test for. Your aneuploidy usually is associated with aging eggs, um, but those deletions, duplications, inversions, more, they can occur in either gender. Okay, point mutations happen at the level of a single nucleotide pair when one base is substituted for another. That usually happens at a weak point in the DNA. Now, I did not write everything on the slide that I'm going to say, which means you don't have to really worry about it too much, but I do want you to understand how this happens. So, you have that long ladder of DNA, right, organized into chromosomes, and they have little loci, little addresses. Within uh, each segment of DNA, you have the base pairs, the guanine, cytosine, adenine, thymine. They arrange in little chunks called triplets. And when the strand of DNA separates and a strand of RNA kind of duplicates what's on there, um, if the bases are in the right order and all of the bases that are supposed to be there are there, you'll build the protein that that gene is supposed to code for, right? Each triplet codes for an amino acid and a protein is made up of chains of amino acids. Um, in certain orders. In a point mutation, one base in that triplet is substituted. So it's kind of like Morse code, right? You have those dots and dashes and they combine in sequences of three to represent letters of the alphabet. And if you know Morse code and the person is sending the right signals, you can decode that into a message. It's the same thing with protein synthesis. But in a point mutation, if you separate, if you 
substitute a dot for a dash, you're going to get a different letter. The word doesn't make as much sense. Now, point mutations can be silent, which means there's no change in um, protein formation, and that's because many amino acids can be formed from the same, from different triplet pairs. Um, for example, alanine can be formed from CGA, CGG, CGT, or CGC. So as long as you start with CG, you could substitute basically anything and still make alanine. Alanine, sorry, alanine is a support group. Um, alanine. However, if you know you have say methionine can only be formed by TAC and you substitute a T in the middle there, you have TTC, you're going to make lysine instead of methionine. Don't get too hung up on it. You don't need to memorize that. Just understand that when you substitute a base pair, you may or may not get a different amino acid. So a silent point mutation means the same protein is formed. A missense point mutation means a different protein is formed. And a nonsense protein or nonsense point mutation means you can't form the protein because there are three sequences that act like a sign or a period at the end of the sentence. So if, for example, you had ATA and then you substituted thymine for an adenine, you have ATT, you're just going to say stop. So it's like you cut off the sentence before you were finished saying what you had to say. That is a nonsense mutation. So it's just going to signal to stop making the protein at that point, whatever point it occurs. Okay. So that's a little bit different from a frame shift mutation. Like I said, base pairs form in groups of three. Each group of three forms a triplet. When it separates, then the strand separates and RNA picks it up as a codon, it will tell the body which protein to make or which amino acid to make in which sequence and how they combine. Substituting a single base pair still gives you groups of three. So in most cases, a point mutation might be a little less serious, um, unless it's a nonsense mutation. Frame shift mutations, you don't end up with groups of three. You end up gr with groups of two or four or one or whatever, but they're not groups of three. You add or delete base pairs. So you have a complete alteration. It just doesn't make sense. You can't form amino acids from that. Um, an example of this could be BRCA1 gene. The normal gene codes for a protein that protects the person from breast and ovarian cancer. It's like a defense mechanism. But if you have a frame shift mu mutation and you add or delete from that sequence, the protein will not be produced and the person will be vulnerable to breast and ovarian cancer. And that's how a frame shift mutation works. Okay, mutational events. Mutations can occur on any genetic level. They can happen like a point mutation at a single nucleotide pair. They can happen in larger segments of DNA, um, like deletions and duplications. They can happen in genes, whole genes that are defective. Um, it can happen in those RNA codons, where there's a mistake made in that sequence. Um, it can happen at the level of a whole chromosome, where you have aneuploidy um, or those translocations or it can affect the genome, and that commonly happens in cancer um, when the cell when the DNA becomes so um, disorganized that it doesn't really resemble the parent genome at all, doesn't act like a normal cell. And these mutations can occur in any part of that copy-paste cycle of cell, uh, cell multiplication, or it can happen in the protein synthesis phase. Um, so for example, it could happen during replication. Replication is when the nucleus of the cell gets the signal to start copying all of its DNA. If it doesn't copy all the information or if it copies something twice, um, it can happen at that point. It can happen in the division phase of mitosis or meiosis where that copied DNA now has to separate into daughter cells. Instead of having a parent cell, you end up with the daughter cells. It can happen during protein synthesis, and that's when something in the message process that tells the body which amino acids to place where, those mutations can happen there. Now, the idea of spontaneous versus induced, a de novo mutation is something that happens for the very first time. 
You will not find it in a family history. And this is common with a lot of those autosomal dominant disorders like Marfan syndrome or Huntington, well, not Huntington, Huntington is pretty stable. Um, Marfan syndrome, achondroplasia is another one that's frequently caused by de novo mutations. Um, they can be in the germline or they can be in the somatic cells or they can be induced from mutagen exposure. Location of mutations is typically at weak points. So sometimes it's just an error, it's a mistake that a cell makes during replication or division, and sometimes a mutagen interferes with the normal replication, replication division of that cell material. All right, so we know DNA is a high fidelity process. We each need a complete copy of the whole script with every word spelled correctly. Um, we can't have extra. And there's a lot of editing mechanisms. There's a lot of quality control. We talked about checkpoints last week. We have enzymes that can clip out errors and replace the incorrect sequence with the correct sequence of bases. But about one in one million errors slip through, and that can vary by individuals. The efficiency of your DNA repair mechanism is inherited from your parents. Um, most people have average repair mechanisms in their youth. They don't suffer from you know, major diseases. <clears throat> they manage day-to-day -day random errors and repair damage from mutagens as they get older. That ability is a little compromised. Some have greater than average function. The cells remain intact. The DNA remains intact. They may have longer telomeres, those little caps at the end of the DNA that protect them. Um, or other repair strategies. And those people will frequently have longevity. And some people have poor repair mechanisms like people with BRCA1, um, and they are more prone to make errors. Now, defense mechanisms are great and they're good. Most of us have adequate defense mechanisms against DNA damage, but if you repeatedly expose your cells to environmental mutagens like tobacco smoke or processed meat or ultraviolet light, you can directly damage your DNA. And if you do it enough times in great enough quantities, you might overwhelm your repair mechanisms. And that's when you get health problems. So some common mutagens, high energy radiation, such as x-rays, they can affect germline cells. They can affect um, cells of a growing embryo. And we know that repeated exposure to radiation can cause cancer. Um, sun exposure is another one. It can cause damage to the skin cells. There are chemical agents like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are found in grilled meat, barbecued chicken. Um, you know, reducing your exposure to those will reduce incidences of cancers related to those. Mustard gas, also known as phosphogene, um, which was common in World War I. Uh, was another mutagen, BPA, which I'm sure you're all looking at a water bottle right now that says BPA free. It's found in plastics. Um, it can cause changes to DNA as well. Nitrates in processed meats are another um, known mutagen. And we have pesticides like DDT or organophosphates. And when you think about ethics, I mean, think about the ethics of exposing people to DDT to kill mosquitoes they don't die of malaria. Um, but possibly altering their genome and leaving them susceptible to illness. And then we have biological agents, things like viruses and bacteria, for example, hepatitis can cause damage to liver cells, which eventually leads to hepatic cancer. Um, Anti-mutagenic substances, these are the things you want to promote. Antioxidants, so think about it. Most plants have defense mechanisms so that they don't sustain damage. <clears throat> You find a lot of antioxidants in fruits and vegetables, especially the more colorful ones. Beans, nuts, seeds, um, also high. And there are some antioxidants found in animal foods as well, but very high in the plant-based um, diet. So we can encourage people um, to increase their intake of whole food in its natural state that has lots of antioxidants. Now, why don't mutations harm us, and why, if our cells are so delicate, aren't we all walking around like the X-Men? Well, many mutations have no effect on the individual. Impact is minimal if the region of DNA is a non-coding region, and that's 95% of your genome doesn't code for specific proteins. So because they're a bigger target, they're going to absorb more, most of the brunt, and it's not going to have any impact on the function of your body. If somatic mutations are limited to small numbers of cells or tissues, there might be no impact on functioning. It's just a benign variation. 
And then we have cell suicide. There are mechanisms in the body that induce apoptosis, that cell death in abnormal cells. And occasionally mutations occur that have benefits to the host. For example, there is a mutation that can prevent white blood cells from becoming infected with HIV, and those individuals with the mutation will stay HIV negative even with exposure to that virus. So most mutations are not really all that harmful. A few of them are devastatingly harmful, but um, we're going to talk now about the concept of deletions, duplications, and inversions. These are things you can detect with some genetic testing. Um, most of them cause pretty rare disorders. Some of them are implicated in things like mental illness or autism or intellectual disability, um, but they're usually involving larger chunks of a chromosome. So multiple genes are affected and that's why you get things that go together. So hearing loss with intellectual disability and impaired balance and coordination. You might get all of those things because multiple genes are affected. They're usually described in terms of location. Some of them have names if they're a little more common, such as that gene locus, the number of chromosome, which arm, which locus, so I gave you an example below of a deletion known as 13q14 deletion, and it's a little more common. It causes retinoblastoma because there is reduced expression of a tumor suppression gene that is specifically targets this cancer. And the result of the deletion is that children at a very young age can develop cancer of the retina. Okay, and so it's that huge chunk of DNA um, and the genes involved target this particular cancer. That's a deletion. You have missing genetic material. You will have reduced expression of a trait. Now, many traits are governed by the expression of several traits working, or several genes working together. But in this case, you get that reduced expression. Duplications mean extra genetic material. That leads to excessive protein pr production. And the example I gave you here is Charcot Marie Tooth Syndrome, which leads to an excessive production of a protein PMP22, and that causes breakdown of the myelin sheath around the nerves. Um, the result is that that person has weakened nerves, decreased motor function. So too much or too little, you know, can lead to things, important functions not being done or functions that need to be limited um, having excessive effect. Okay, inversions means a piece of chromosome breaks off and reattaches itself, but it's upside down. And it usually happens as a de novo mutation in the sex cell. Sometimes DNA is lost, it breaks off into little fab, uh, fragments, and sometimes it's all there and it's not, you know, it's all present, it's just in the wrong spot. It can be, um, it can pick up DNA, it can pick up a fragment of DNA from another chromosome. So an example of an inversion is chromosome 17 Q12. So a little piece of chromosome 17 breaks off at a weak point, reattaches itself to the same chromosome, but in that process, even though it reattached, a little bit of genetic material was lost. And so we had some micro deletion. We have RCAD, renal cysts and diabetes syndrome, not only do people get cystic kidneys and diabetes, but they have a higher incidence of autism, schizophrenia, and intellectual disability, with some people having none of those symptoms, um, kind of depending on how much uh, function is lost. So these are some of the ways that our genes can mutate. And that is the end of this presentation. What I really want you to take home from it is, this week we learned about family history and how traits are inherited we also learned a little bit about how the proteins in the body can change because of mutations to genetic material. Um, I'll guide you with an a graded quiz so that you can kind of see what things I might put on the midterm exam, which is coming up in the next week. Um, but I think you have enough for now.